In this video, we're going to illustrate the application of the test of two independent proportions applied in Microsoft Excel. So the scenario that we're dealing with is we want to compare whether people who have a lower or higher level of spending on craft beer, specifically those who spend less than $5 per week or greater than $5 per week, whether their familiarity or awareness level of pizza port, a craft brewery, is different. Let's apply what we have establish as our overall research question, our analysis objectives, and the variables we've identified. Let's see if we can apply those using the statistical test selection roadmap. So here is a part of the statistical test roadmap. How we apply this is we solve from left to right to figure out what the right test to use is. And the first thing I notice in my research question and analysis objective is that I want to compare between two different groups of people. So I want to split my data set up into exactly two partitions, each representing different types of consumers. I'm going to use the spending craft beer variable to create those two groupings. This serves as my independent variable or my categorization variable. And looking through all the options in the rows on the first column here, I see that this particular row says one independent variable with two levels. The levels are the groups and they're independent groups. Independent means you can't belong to one and also belong to the other. They are just completely separate. In other words, if you spend $4 on craft beer, you're clearly in the under $5 group. You can't belong to the other. So that gets me started on figuring out the right statistical test to use. Next, I have to figure out the nature of my dependent variable. The dependent variable, the variable I'm interested in here, is the percentage awareness of pizza port. And if I want to calculate a percentage, that means I'm treating it as a nominal variable. And in this particular case, the variable is already set up as nominal. It only has two options in the data in the data set per my codebook. Either people are familiar or not familiar. I can certainly calculate the percentage of people who are familiar from that variable. That tells me that my nature of my dependent variable is categorical, and specifically, it has exactly two categories. And by simply answering those two questions, I realized the correct statistical test to use is the test of two independent proportions. In other words, I want to test two percentages. So let's formalize this into a proper hypothesis. We have our independent group one, those who spend less than or equal to $5 of craft beer per week. We have our independent group two, those individuals who spend greater than $5 in craft beer per week. And we want to compare the percentage of people in each group that are aware of Pizza Port Brewing Company. Now, my initial hypothesis is that the groups have an equal percent of familiarity with pizza port. But we need to articulate this properly and articulate the null and alternative hypothesis. Stated more formally, the null hypothesis is that the groups have an equal percent of familiarity with pizza port. The alternative hypothesis has to cover every other possible situation. In this case, the hypothesis is simply the groups have an unequal percentage of familiarity with pizza port. This is a formal articulation of the null and alternative hypothesis. Now, unfortunately, especially if you're newer with marketing research, the way we articulate these types of hypotheses are usually slightly more informal. What you're likely to see is someone saying that our, our hypothesis is that the groups have an unequal percentage of familiarity with pizza port. What this really means is they're just articulating the alternative hypothesis, which they assume you, the reader, understand, which means you also understand what the null hypothesis is. It's a bit jargony, but it's very common in marketing research reports to talk about hypotheses in this way. Unfortunately, if you're new at marketing research, you have to be able to identify when people are more informally stating their hypotheses so that you can then properly interpret what the null and alternative hypothesis is. Now that we clearly understand our hypothesis and we have an idea of the variables we want to use, let's implement this using Microsoft Excel. There's a few different options that we consider when trying to implement a statistical test in Excel. And unfortunately, option one, using the data analysis tool pack, is not going to work for us. But that's not going to stop us. A second option is we could calculate the entire test by hand or using formulas uh, in Excel. We're not going to do that either. Instead, we're going to use a slightly easier approach. We're going to use Excel to get some of the basic summary numbers that we need to conduct the test. Then we'll use a simple online free calculator to perform and report the test for us. There's lots of online calculators for the test of two independent proportions available online, but I do highly recommend you use the one that I show in the video here. Link is provided accompanying this video nearby. We'll see a menu like this. The inputs on the left-hand side are the values we have to plug in to properly run the test and get the results that come from the right-hand side. 
The reason I suggest you use this particular calculator is it runs a slightly more complex version of the basic uh, independent proportions test. And more importantly, it's going to give us a confidence interval result. Um, and we'll see that that's a quite convenient and nice result that is useful for us when we write up our results. Here's the underlying equations that the calculator is going to do for us. They look a bit daunting. Uh, on close inspection, they're really not so bad. A lot of those numbers are quite redundant. The equation on the left is going to give us the lower end of the confidence interval for our difference in percentage estimate. And the equation on the right hand side is going to give us the upper end confidence interval estimate uh, for the difference in our percentages between the two groups. So now I'm stating the same exact null and alternative hypotheses we had a little earlier, but just a little more technical. So now our, our null hypothesis is that there's no difference, so P2 proportion in group 2 minus the proportion in group 1 equaled 0, no difference in pizza port familiarity. And our, al our alternative is that P2 minus P1 doesn't equal 0. There is some meaningful difference in the proportion of people who are familiar with pizza port. What we'll see is if our confidence interval range does not include the number 0, we will reject our null hypothesis and we will claim that the alternative hypothesis is likely true, meaning there is really a difference in familiarity. Now to use this website calculator, our first input is to set our confidence level. We're going to probably plug in 0.95 as this will correspond to a 95% confidence level. P1 and P2 are simply the proportion of people in each of our two groups that are in fact familiar with pizza port. We'll calculate those numbers in Excel, and then we need to know the sample size for each of the two groups. Sample size, of course, has an impact on our margin of error. We'll get some results. Importantly, the lower and upper boundary of the difference estimate. This will be the results that we use, as explained earlier, to interpret the results of the statistical test. Now that I know the inputs that I need for my statistical test, I need to see if I need to do any prep work or modification work to my data set to actually derive those values. This is a good time to inspect my code book of my data set and figure out if I'm going to need to do any modifications. When I look at my spend craft beer codebook, it clearly indicates to me that I am going to have to modify this variable into a new one in order to create my two groupings. First, I want to ignore those people who said they don't know how much they spend on craft beer. My less than $5 group is already specified. They're coded as zero. However, anyone coded from one to eight can qualify for my over $5 group. I'm going to need to create a new variable in my data set that aggregates these all into one group for me. Luckily for us, it's a piece of cake to do this and something we already know how to do. We're going to make a new variable column that groups the spending variable into two groups. And then afterwards, we'll make a pivot table that allows me to see the percentages and sample sizes. Therefore, I can take those numbers that I derive and plug them into the online calculator. How I'm going to do this? is I'll take my original variable, shown here, boxed in red. I will then set up a VLOOKUP table, which we've illustrated in previous videos, setting my previous codes on the left-hand side and setting up my new group labels. In this case, I used text to indicate and group the new groupings that I need for this test. I then implement that test with my handy-dandy VLOOKUP function, illustrated in the boxed orange here. Next, we're going to head into Excel, and we'll accelerate through the application of this VLOOKUP. Again, check out a previous video if you need more practice with how to use VLOOKUP for recoding into a new variable. Now that we've created our new variable, we're ready to set up our Excel pivot table. How we'll do that is we'll put our brewery awareness question for pizza port into the rows, our new grouped variable into our columns, and we'll simply put the count of the ID number in the values. Once we do that, we will derive our values. We'll get our sample size immediately as the count. So we have a sample size of 77 individuals who spend less than $5 per week on craft beer and a sample size of 146 who spend more. We'll then adjust our pivot table. So instead of showing the raw counts, it'll show the column percentages. 
And these column percentages are going to tell us the percent of individuals who are familiar with pizza port in each group. And we'll see here that in the less than $5 group, it's 27.27%. And over $5, it's 671 Heading to the next part of the video, we will actually implement this pivot table in Excel. Keep in mind the example in this video moves fast. If you need more practice with pivot tables, see our previous video series. Now that we have the values extracted from our Excel analysis, we simply plug them into the online calculator, set our confidence level at a 95% level because that's a typical level of precision we expect, and we get our results. And the difference is simply just P2 minus P1, so a difference of 40.5 percentage points. And here's our lower and upper confidence level of this difference estimate, which actually allows us to interpret our statistical test. Now how we might write up this result is the following. 67.8% of people who spend over $5 per week on craft beer were familiar with pizza port, while only 27.3% of people who spent less than $5 per week were familiar, a difference of 40.5 percentage points. The 95% confidence interval of this difference was estimated to be between 27 and 54 percentage points. Based on this result, we conclude that people who spend more money on craft beer are indeed more likely to be familiar with the craft brewery pizza port. A more compact way of writing this, assuming our audience is more familiar with the way we're conducting our analysis and we don't need to be quite as elaborate, we could say 67.8% of people who spend over $5 per week on craft beer were familiar with pizza port, while only 27.3% of people who spent less than $5 per week were familiar. A difference in familiar, familiarity of pizza port between the craft beer spending groups was statistically significant at a 95% confidence level. Notice this latter example is more compact, but it also hides a few relevant details and puts a little more burden on our audience that they actually understand what's going on. Now, why did we just, now why did we reject the null hypothesis? Why did this confidence interval tell us there's a statistically significant difference here? Quick refresher if you're not familiar. Remember what our null hypothesis and our alternative hypotheses were. Our null hypothesis is that the difference in percentages, so if you literally just did the arithmetic, it'd be zero. They're exactly the same. Now, when we did the arithmetic, before any statistical analysis, we simply could have seen that the difference in familiarity was 40.5%. However, at this stage, we can't actually interpret the hypothesis yet. Why not? That's because we're analyzing a sample, and we want to project our results to the entire population. However, when we have a sample rather than a population, there's uncertainty in our estimates. Therefore, we want to be at least 95% confident that our difference that we're seeing in the sample will indeed be unlikely to include zero, a possibility, when we project it to the population. That's where the confidence interval, the lower and upper numbers, become so useful. Our 95% confidence interval set the percentage difference estimate between 27 and 54%. And what's important here is that when we look between 27 and 54%, zero is not found. So within this range of confidence, we are in fact willing, confidently willing to claim that according to our analysis, there is a difference between these two groups. Now, how do we typically visualize these results of a statistical test? A stacked bar chart is a common way to show two proportions, or sometimes just a simple bar chart between two groups just showing the relevant percentage. In the example here, our green represents the percentage of each group 
that was familiar with Pizza Port. There were a few that were uh, they didn't know if they were familiar or not in the less than five dollar group. That you, so we included them down here. They're part of this other answer, if you will. And of course, we could have a meaningful discussion about how we might want to modify this presentation of chart. We might consider adding percentage labels to the relevant cells, or we might want to consider changing this color scheme. Bright red and green is not exactly the most attractive or appropriate in all instances. In this video, we learned a real world example of how to apply the test of two independent proportions. We identified a relevant marketing research question. We identified the data in our data set that could be used to analyze it. We use that information to identify that this was the correct statistical test to use from a set of alternatives. We then inspected the needs of the data to actually apply it using Microsoft Excel. We cleaned up and modified our data set so we could derive those values. And then we implemented the test, in this case using an online calculator. And then we then interpreted the results of the test and wrote up the results.